So, hey everyone, thank you for having me here. And uh, how many people have used the Pirate Bay? And the rest are sleeping or just lying? Okay, so my name is Peter. I'm Finnish Norwegian. Finland is not Scandinavia, very important to say. Uh, Scandinavia just, you know, they just invade us every now and then. Uh, we call Sweden our US in Scandinavia. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my, basically my, let's, let's see if this works. It does maybe work, yeah. I'm going to tell you a little about why I do the things I do. Because the most important thing for me when I deal with technology or whatever I deal with is that there needs to be a why. Basically, when I was doing the Pirate Bay, all of these things, it was like really important for me that we're, it was about the quality. I wanted people to be able to share information. I didn't really care about money or anything like that. This was the thing for all of us. We were interested in technology and making things equal, because that's the why. We were, everyone needed to have the same opportunities. So we started with the Pirate Bay, and uh, we were not the first. We were not the best. Uh, Pirate Bay was never the best. It's still really, really sucky. Uh, but it had a purpose. And one of the really important things we did is that when everyone started getting threatening letters that were all of the people running file sharing systems, they got these threatening letters. We decided we're not going to take down the site. And we knew that Swedish law was very clear. Pirate Bay was actually in, in Sweden at the time, before it was in Mexico, long story. Um, but it was really clear to us that we were legal and we would not shut down even though there was a lot of pressure. So everyone else who was running file sharing systems, they got, um, they got really scared when they're getting letters from Hollywood. Uh, most of these lawyers cost more than uh, the guys running the file sharing systems would make in like, in like a year. They would make more than in one day. So we started, all, all of us started getting these letters and, and we decided we're going to publish them. And just to show people what goes on, on the, in the internet behind the scenes. So we published all of the documents that we got from Microsoft, from DreamWorks. And we also replied to all of them. And we published the replies. So Pirate Bay was never really good at technology, but we were really good at marketing, this viral thing that you probably heard about. And our thing was about the legal threats. So we published them. And uh, we told people like DreamWorks, like, we don't really care about copyright in the United States. Because we have polar bears in Scandinavia that are trying to kill us. You know, that's more important to us to fight for. We sent them world maps and says, like, here is the United States, here is Europe. You have to invade us. You might, you know, as you usually do, but you have to do that before you decide what's legal and not legal in our country. And we told them to fuck off. That's very, very typical what we did. Uh, and sometimes we did really clever uh, replies as well. This is my favorite one. This is from a German company that owns basically all of the fonts in the world, uh, especially Helvetica, which you all have used so many times and you've seen everywhere. And they sent us a letter saying, like, we found these fonts on your website. People are downloading them illegally. And you need to sign this contract and this cease and desist declaration uh, and pay us money because you're criminals and blah, blah, blah. So what do you do with a thing like this? Of course, we copied the letter uh, and told them that you have to pay us money and everything and stop sending us these frivolous letters and so on. And of course, we used all of the fonts they complained about. <laughs> So, so we really we understood kind of the potential in getting uh, a lot of marketing. And you know what? I have a picture of North Korea here. We started realizing that uh, we needed to play a lot of jokes on people and make people discuss like the narratives of things and make people understand that you can't just listen to one side in a conflict. And you can't just have a narrative that's this wide. Someone needs to go outside of that scope and be totally insane. And this is like what we did very well. So um, usually we uh, did a lot of jokes on 1st of April, but we decided why 1st of April? Let's do it all the time. Uh, so one time we actually stole all of North Korea's IP space because we were really good at technology and said we were hosted in North Korea. Uh, and this is typical what we did. Like People thought it was real because they could see that we were using North Korean IP space. I'm sorry, people of North Korea could not use the internet for two weeks when we had the IP space. But still, you know, it was worth it. Um, but we did all of these things, and people were really confused. Like, are these for real? What kind of people are them? And they, especially our opponents, Hollywood, they were really upset about us and started calling us pirates. Like, that's bad. And then they made movies about how cool pirates are. I don't really know their logic. But that was kind of the thing. But we decided to be very inspired by the gay movement and kind of reclaiming words. So we started reclaiming pirate as a cool thing. And we just wanted people to understand that this is much more, you know, much better way of sharing information. Do you know how big Pirate Bay has been? Have any, any clue? You've all used it, but do you know how much uh, you know, the fibers were full of stuff from Pirate Bay? No one? So I can just tell you like a fun fact. Like for a while, Pirate Bay was more than half of everything in all of the internet cables everywhere in the world. And 
there's this funny thing. We were three people running the Pirate Bay, everything for a hobby, and like one drunk, one on drugs, and a third guy. So we never really decide who's whom. That's very easy to see if you watch our documentary. Um, but this is kind of the thing. Like when a guy trips in our data center and broke a cable to one of our routers, half of the internet just vanished. Just like for days, it could be gone. And then you have these conferences where like Cisco and other companies are trying to get the internet like to a safe place, uh, spending millions and millions and millions. They should just like make sure that someone goes to rehab instead. Much much cheaper. But we had this thing, so going on, like this thing that uh, we were reclaiming things, and we were basically winning the, the, the hearts of the people. Uh, we were sure we were legal and so on, but our opponents, they started calling us different names. I'm going to show you a little clip from the documentary, one of the documentaries about the Pirate Bay. To start with, so I don't think that there would be some form of av idé hos vanliga ungdomar om att upphovsrätt skulle vara fel eller så. Det, 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 det tror jag är en myt och den har, den har liksom de här, den här kopimistsekten varit väldigt duktiga på att marknadsföra. So, this woman that you see, she's the representative of Hollywood in Europe, really professional lawyer. And she was calling us a cult, and that's kind of fun. And my way is like, if you call us something, we're going to try and become that. So that's kind of my idea. And also very interesting is that she has two clients. She's the representative in Europe for Hollywood and the Church of Scientology. <laughs> so she has some sort of information about cults and what that is. Uh, and she probably understood that it's really powerful being called a cult, and no one takes you serious after that from her experience. But what do you do in a case like this? You do this. This is wild. Some people seem uh, to worship technology, but now it's being recognized as a religion. Yes, in Sweden, a church whose central tenet is the right to file share has been formally recognized by the Swedish government. It's called the Church of Copy Meism, uh, I guess. Copy Meism or Copy Mism. Okay, and it claims that copy acting, sharing information through copying, is akin to a religious service. Yeah. So a funny story. In Sweden, it costs 50 euros to start a religion. <laughs> it's very simple. And it has a different thing. There's also everything I do is a little bit political. And the th good thing with having uh, your own religion is that it turns out that all of these data retention uh, directives, all of these directives have one uh, small exception where you're not allowed to store data or listening to data. And that is when you're talking to your priest. So instead of peer-to-peer -peer communication, we decided we're going to have priest-to-priest -priest communication. <laughs> and if you violate the right of the people sharing information, which is a religious service, according to us, you're actually violating that law. So you have to go to prison for four years, which is much worse than breaking copyright. And you know, I don't have a lot of time, but this is a funny story. I was in Belgrade a few years after we started this church, and I was at a conference. And uh, obviously, this is a big joke for a lot of people, but we're like, 40 countries, this is a church now, and there's millions of people that probably believe in this, and like registered, it's like 40, 50,000 registered members of the church. And I met two people that wanted to get married in the church of copimism. And we were talking about like what would a, a marriage like be in the copimism, and you know, what kind of service would you have, what kind of wedding would it be? And I just joke and said, you need lasers, of course, you know, lasers are cool, so let's get lasers. And then just after like five minutes of talking, I wanted to ask the guy like, are you really on board with this as a joke? And this man just told me when I asked him, like, I just think you're testing my faith, actually. <laughs> so I, I think I actually did start a cult, but it was totally worth it. 50 euros, no money whatsoever. Uh, but for me, one of the big problems I have with all of these things is that, you know, we as activists, we can make things fun and we can make it important, but we're trying to understand kind of what the internet is becoming and we're trying to get some power over this. So you've all heard of ACTA, which we managed to stop. And we're really happy about that being part of like, this activism group. But I am not really happy about the situation, because this is now coming in something else called TPP and TTIP and all of these things. So like, all of the things that are trying to uh, uh, you know, break the internet, break society as we know it, has been totally, totally fucked up. And we're not winning this war. And for me, i starting realizing it is a sort of um, problem of narratives. So the narrative is always like technology is good. So all new technology is good, and there's going to be some things here and there, but it's always going to be good. Like Uber is good, Airbnb is good. There's no talk about ethics. There's no talk about you know, uh, all of these morals that we have to deal with as tech people. 
Because now tech people are becoming really the most influential people on the earth, except this guy. Uh, and for me, this is part of the same problem. Like, we have these insane people, uh, both of these guys who are basically the same guy, uh, that are trying to fuck up everything that we're doing. And we're part of this. This is our problem. We joke about it, we laugh about it, but we're all part of this. Like, do you ever, when you start your companies, talk about what kind of morals and ethics your company is going to have? You're no, you don't talk about why. Instead, you talk about you know, just how you're going to raise money and how you're going to be successful. But what is success? The problem is that we've moved all of the power in society from being political people into being you know, Mark Zuckerbergs and the like. These are more influential people than any other politician in, in Earth. And we all come from this kind of idea that we are the underdog. Uh, I want to show you another clip, because if I show video clips, I cannot speak and I can drink water. This is uh, something that you've probably heard about but never seen before. But he left one final warning. 1984 is, I believe, a quite terrifying masterpiece. So terrifying, in fact, I don't think I should like to read another like it. I am not absolutely dissatisfied with it. I think it is a good idea, but the execution would have been better if I had not been under the influence of TB when I wrote it. You once claimed that you have an ability to face unpleasant facts. Is that what you've demonstrated in 1984 by drawing an accurate portrait of the future? I think that allowing for the book being, after all, a parody, something like 1984 could actually happen. This is the direction the world is going in at the present time. In our world, there will be no emotions except fear, rage, triumph, and self-abasement. The sex instinct will be eradicated. We shall abolish the orgasm. There will be no loyalty except loyalty to the party. But always there will be the intoxication of power. Always, at every moment, there will be the thrill of victory, the sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. The moral to be drawn from this dangerous nightmare situation is a simple one. Don't let it happen. It depends on you. So George Orwell is not the most enjoyable man to watch. He's right about some things and he's wrong about some things. Let's, the, the wrong thing is like, obviously, the future did not abolish the orgasm. Internet was really good at giving orgasms. Not, well, mainly solo orgasms. But still, it's, you know, it's, uh, I think it's, we've never had as much sex as before, but with ourselves. And have you noticed that this face boot thing, it lo sounds like Facebook, face boot, you know? We're already at that position, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm thinking, like, we already know that the future is going to be really centralized and it's going to be really full of power. So let's start talking about this. Um, this dream of startups fixing the world, I don't really believe in it. I think that that's a big myth and that's a big lie. I think that we need to take responsibility for what we're doing. So, you know, we as technologists, when we see censorship on the internet, we can bypass and we can laugh about the censorship. But we're setting examples for the next generation and for, for the governments to agree that this is okay to do. So Pirate Bay, I'm, I'm happy to say, we're the most censored website ever in the world. That's really, really funny. But for different reasons in different countries. So like in China, Pirate Bay is censored because of freedom of speech. And in other countries, it's because the porn is not good enough or something like that. I don't know. But all of the people I know that are technologists, they are like, we laugh at the censorship. But for me, this is something which goes hand in hand with other things happening in society. So like when you talk about uh, you know, new technologies and we talk about 3D printers, stuff like this, uh, we, we laugh a little bit about the importance of them. Some understand they might be really, really big. Uh, but if you see all of the trends in technology and you know it's going to be really, really rapidly, we're going to use 3D printer for stuff like food and so in the future. And if you look at what's going on in, in society, like we tend to centralize stuff. How many want to go on Foodify and get your recipes from there? You know, I don't want to do that. I want to have my own recipes that I own and control. Uh, so I'm not really happy with this centralization of stuff. 
And we went from like this world where we had like actual products that we sold, and then we got virtual products, and now we have virtually no product whatsoever as the thing that we're marketing. And this is setting you know, really bad examples for a lot of things in the world. So if you go back to this thing that we're centralizing, we're censoring all of these things in, on the internet, we can kind of figure out what's going to happen in the other topics as well. So like, let's talk about self-driving cars. Of course, we're going to have self-driving cars. We're not questioning that. 10 years ago, it was uh, totally a utopia that we had self-driving cars. But I kind of think that when we start having these self-driving cars, it's going to be very few companies that are going to run them. And the government's going to say, like, you're not allowed to go to these places. So using the censorship of domain names and so on, maybe we just take stuff out of the maps that you're not allowed to go to. So we're going to have a centralized system based upon the things we decide today. Because information technology, would just like it goes really, really rapidly in development. But the laws that we say now, they're going to be there in the next uh, years as well. And we need to take responsibility for this. And this is not just technology, it's everything. And even the guys at this conference, you know, we need to take responsibility. So one of the most important topics right now is equality. We all need to talk about equality, especially in Europe. We have a lot of people coming from other countries. Integration equality is really key to a, a functioning democracy. But here we invite a really rich man from the United States to come and talk for 50 minutes about how much money he has and how much more money he's going to get. And we are like, wow, he's a cool guy, really great guy. We're going to you know, embrace him. And then you have a really clever woman who's been part of revenge porn talking for 50 minutes about her solution to that. This is the wrong balance. You know, we should have it the other way around. Because we know about money, we don't know about the other thing. <laughs> I'm so over time, I think. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite writers is Fyodor Dostoevsky. I read him in prison and outside of prison. That's another story, I don't have time for that. But he said that the greatest happiness is to know your unhappiness. I know my unhappiness, but I don't see any way of fixing that. So it's like the matrix, like Neo had the red pill and the blue pill. Uh, and like we took both of them. We know all of the problems we have, but we don't do anything with them. So we need to change narratives. I tried to do this with like uh, jokingly and art, and art and so on. Like uh, ma I made a, something called a copy machine. This is like my way of showing that we know things are broken. The music industry, which I, tend to fight with quite a lot. They think that every copied song in the world is worth $1.25. Every time you copy a song, you know, they are going to lose $1 or something. So I made a machine that just copies one song and deletes it, and then just does this all the time. So according to my small Raspberry Pi, they've lost like $100 billion this year. So it must be a really thriving economy. You know, these are really interesting things. And this narrative thing, someone decide what a narrative is. This has nothing to do with it. This is just a funny picture. Uh, but for me, it's, it's something that we need to discuss, like who sets the narrative and who's interested in the main topics of society, like democracy. So last year, there was a really important uh, election in, in Denmark. And because of integration and, uh, and immigration issues, uh, people said this is the most important election ever in Denmark. And how interested are people in democracy? And it turns out not a lot, um, which we kind of figured already. This is the uh, screenshot from the Danish uh, radio, uh, which is the TV in, in Denmark, because they are not really good at languages. Uh, this is a screenshot from their website during the night of the election. And like the, the, most imp the most viewed show at the time, one hour before the election closes, is some sort of comedy show, which I totally get. The second one is the Swedish royal wedding. You know, it's not even in their country, and it's a monarchy. On the third place is talking about democracy. So I think this is a problem we need to all address, and we are all responsible for this. And the more kind of into technology you are, the more power you get, and the more responsible you actually are yourself. So I kind of understood that, you know, the only way to win this game is to not play at all, like in the war games. But we played, so we have to, like, crash it as soon as possible. And, you know, when you're, you know, wanted by Interpol, you have to do things differently. Have you, you know, this problem? Uh, so I decided when I was wanted by the Interpol that I was going to run for office uh, to change politics and also to get diplomatic immunity so I didn't have to go to prison. Didn't work out. Uh, but for me, it's always about the narrative. So I wanted people to talk about internet and so on. And I don't like politicians most of the time. So I wanted to do a political campaign that was about not bragging or lying to people and not talking shit about other politicians. Um, so I'm going to end with showing you my uh, video for uh, the European Union Parliament, uh, the most viewed uh, kind of political campaign video in Europe ever. Uh, 
And I'm going to end with that, and I'm going to go hide, because it's embarrassing. This, I just, just as a note, after this video, I got eight pages in the biggest newspaper on the day of the election. But I'm not clever enough anyhow to win, so sorry for this. I'm going to go hide. Shit.